Hello, everyone, and welcome to the GG Dispatch. I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. And you are officially tuned in to the GG Dispatch. Each week on Tuesday, bright and early, we consolidate the week's biggest headline in gaming news. Whether you're listening on your commute, during your workout, or you just have us on in the background, we want to thank you for listening in. Uh, We had quite an influx of listeners this uh, past week. Don't know where a handful of y'all came from, but we're happy to have you around and invite you to uh, keep coming back. So thanks again uh, for all of our our listeners and faithful listeners as we enter our sixth episode already. Isn't that crazy, Alan? We've been doing this for like a month and a half. Yeah, it's going by fast. It's going by fast. Time flies when you're having fun and talking about video games. So um, I before we get into the video games, though, I have to ask a very serious question uh, regarding the holidays. So um, it is, you know, we, we, we've passed Halloween. We're officially well into November. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Uh, and I just want to ask you, when is the appropriate time to decorate for the holidays? Now, I'm, I know not everybody observes Christmas, celebrates Christmas, but like, when do you break out the wreaths? When do you break out the lights? When do you break out the decals, like the ornaments, the non-denominational sort of holiday decorations? Like when, when should they come out in your opinion? Well, some of my family members go a lot harder than others. Uh, for our little family, um, I know that my mom and my dad, they like to kind of start decorating more fall-like around this time of year. And then after Thanksgiving, they break out the Christmas stuff. Uh, however, my sister-in-law, like, she goes into Christmas stuff as soon as she can. Uh, personally, I don't mind either way. I, I do like to give Thanksgiving a little bit of time, though, a little bit of more Thanksgiving, like, uh, decoration. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. What I always find is basically once Labor Day passes, I feel like the later part of the year flies by. It's like a downhill. Like, you like you blink it's labor day you blink it's halloween you blink it's thanksgiving like it just goes by so quickly and so you know my wife and i we actually put up our christmas decorations yesterday and you know we just we just want to be able to enjoy the season because we feel like if we wait until after thanksgiving like even the day after thanksgiving and we're both you know very privileged to have um the you know be able to have ample time off around the holidays too so like black friday neither of us have to go and do any sort of work or anything we, we've got the whole week off actually and so um you know we could put up the decorations then but then you know we're missing out on like a week we can have we can have the decorations up so um with that in mind we're usually we're usually putting up our decorations before thanksgiving um but not too much not too far ahead of time like a week we can have maybe but um but yeah that's kind of where we stand on it um all right well glad to know if you're listening in I, we'd love to know you know feel free to share in the comments on Podbean or jump into our discord or whatever happy to hear your take on when the holiday decorations go up um if it's if it's uh, after halloween it's fair game or if you're waiting until uh, black friday or even december 1st wh- wherever that line is for you be happy to hear what that is but enough about that we have lots to talk about oh my gosh every week has been jam packed with stuff, but this last week has been especially crazy. Um, starting with arguably, and I know we say this a lot. I feel like this term is tossed around like the most anticipated game of all time or, or the year or whatever. But I think a special category is set aside for GTA six. Um, and that is what we received in this past week when rockstar games has officially announced that GTA 6 is coming uh, with a trailer uh, set to be released in early December. So, Alan, what what's your take on this news? Are are you a big GTA fan yourself? Like, you know, are are you excited for this? Tell me, tell me about how you're taking in the revelation that GTA 6 is actually a game that exists and is going to come out. Oh, I'm extremely hyped. Uh, for a while, I kind of stopped playing video games for a bit. 
And then I played Grand Theft Auto Five. This is probably summer of like 2018, and it completely sucked me in. And ever since then, I've been playing way more video games. Like it literally got me back into gaming. Uh, just the story, the graphics, the gameplay. It just nailed everything. I wanted to just be in that world as long as I could. So I'm extremely hyped for Grand Theft Auto 6. And you're 100% right. There are certain games that are like in this type of category where people on uh, Twitter are basically having a trend of like where I was 10 years ago when GTA 5 came out to where I am now where GTA 6 was announced. Like that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time coming for sure. And and I think... Uh, lots of folks in the gaming community are very excited. I have to admit, I have not played any GTA. Like, none. It's like, I feel like a sort of sacrilege, but it's true. Um, and yet, I know the impact that GTA 5 has had on the industry. Of course, I'm a huge fan of Red Dead Redemption as a franchise, and of course, Red Dead Redemption 2, which is uh, another iconic title on the on the PS4 uh, really kind of pushing the limits of the console and, and probably one of the most beautiful open world games out there. Um, but I just never really got into, into GTA. But um, with that being said, you know, there's definitely, you're feeling those ripple effects of that announcement. And GTA five is one of the most profitable IPs of, of all time. Um, so it's, or titles of all time, like just as a video game, it's, I think it's gross, like 2 billion or, more dollars uh, over the course of its life, which is insane. So um, yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, and I know I'm definitely looking forward to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and a lot of other games are coming, Wolverine from Insomniac, et cetera. But I think the whole industry is sort of keeping an eye on GTA six when it's coming so that they can get the hell out of the way. <laughs> because I don't think anybody's going to want to be within like a two month release of GTA six. Honestly, I think it'd be really cool if you've got like extra time and like you don't have a backlog, just pick up GTA Five. It's like twenty bucks, and, and then when it's on sale, it's ten. I, I think it'd be really cool to get your perspective now to like have that be your first Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, yeah, I might have to check it out. I mean, I can't say that I don't have a backlog. My backlog is disgusting, but uh, that doesn't mean that I can't <laughs> get into GTA Five and and spend some time in there. So I might just have to do that. I'll report back and let you know what I find um all right speaking of games that we are looking for to come out uh and release dates uh mass effect 5 uh or mass effect epsilon as it was teased after n7 day is reportedly looking at a 2029 release date yeah 2029 the year of our lord 2029 six years from now so giant bombs uh jeff grubb uh has is basically uh is basically saying that uh this game mass effect 5 uh is not even close to coming out basically it's the same sort of timeline as uh dragon age dreadwolf which they released you know they kind of teased in 2018 and now it's going to be coming out, you know, it's coming out next year, which is about a six year, uh, six year time frame. And so Mass Effect 5 is looking at the same thing. So teased this year, released in 2029. Alan, why? <laughs> like, do we need, do gamers need to know that a game is coming out six years in advance? Do you think that, that there's any sort of argument to be made that if they didn't do something like this, that fans would forget about the franchise entirely? Uh, no, I think it's insane that they did this. I know that uh, publishers for sure kind of struggle with when do we kind of tell the world that this game exists, what it's about. Uh, it is a constant push and pull, but this is definitely way too soon. I think that you can continue to celebrate Mass Effect and have a, a fun time with the community without necessarily telling them, hey, we're working on the next one. See you in 2029. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, and again, this is this is reporting. This isn't direct from the publisher or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, they're definitely taking it with a grain of salt. However, I do think that it's um, 
it, there's some validity here, right? Again, if you're looking at the Dreadwolf uh, timeline, if you're looking at, you know, triple eight game development in general, with the exception of a few high performing studios like Insomniac, et cetera, that are putting out really great games every two to three years, most, um, you know, a five to six year time frame is, is pretty standard. But again, that being said, I, I agree. If there if this is an accurate timeline, it's way too early to have been given that sort of teaser. Like, I I just think it's way too early. I think I think three years, even four years, can be manageable because you know in game cycles and things to do like that that can kind of sneak up on you. Um, time is a flat circle, man. But uh, you know, for for six years out, like the the whole industry is going to change. We're going to be in a whole new generation by then. Like. You know, <laughs> it, it's going to yeah, be six. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to be a brave new world, honestly, by then. And so it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around if you'll even be interested in a game like that in 2029, right? Like, of course you will, right? Like by the time it gets here, of course we will. But, you know, it's so far out there that you're like, well, I still even like video games in six years. Like it's that long of a time frame to say, you know, I won't even be the same kind of person like at my core that I am now. So um so yeah it's 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 interesting i i'm i will wait and see how much uh of that actually carries weight in the end uh i'm hoping it's it's a bit sooner than initially estimated i hope close for like 2027 um but of course want to make sure the game is done properly and we do not get another andromeda uh i don't think the franchise would survive it um so that's good to know speaking of game releases uh and extended timelines uh, we received news the past week that sony is delaying half of its planned live service games so there were about a dozen that they were planning on investing in uh and and releasing in a shorter time frame and since then they pushed six of them out uh to you know i think past 2025 um <clears throat> so I am curious to hear your kind of reaction to this, Alan. Like, do you think that ultimately some of these games that are getting delayed will ultimately get canceled? Um, do you think it's, you know, a kind of troubling sign of of the investment that Sony is making around games as a service? Like, what what are your thoughts on, on this? There's a lot here. Uh, first, 12, that sounds like way too much. That feels like a... We're going to throw every, everything at the wall and see what sticks. So that is concerning. Yeah. Uh, however, at the very least, it seems like this pause is because they recognize that a lot of the games being worked on, like the quality just isn't there. So at the very least, they do care about quality. Right. Uh, but I mean, that makes sense because as Sony, you've got, you know, Uncharted, you've got The Last of Us. I think that for them, that's what they want to do with their properties. And then making something that's so incredible that you can then go and make a TV show that becomes, you know, a hit even with people who've never played your series before. Uh, but you can't do that releasing mid game. You just can't. Yeah. Uh, so I think that for sure, we're not going to ever see the 12 come out. Uh, probably closer to just the six. Uh, and from those maybe six, eight, maybe I don't know, <laughs> but <laughs> I agree. I, I don't think we're going to see all 12. And I, you know, I was chatting with some, some work colleagues about this as well. Like when you have a good game as a service, like a really good one, it is all, that's it. That is the only thing that a gamer does. Like they eat, sleep, breathe that game. They stay up to date on the daily quests. They enroll in all the season passes they you know, rush home from work or school to get on the game. They spend their their vacations on the game. Like they, you know, that's the level of investment that those players have. And so they they buy the you know the supplemental things. They buy the they invest in the microtransactions to enhance their experience in that game in that world. At most, at most, a gamer might have two, maybe three of those games, maybe. There is no universe where Sony releases 12 new game as a service and even half of them end up being successful. 
Like, I just don't see it happening. They'll be looking to get one. And that's okay. And that's the other side of the argument, right? Is, you know, so I had some folks saying like, yes, they're investing a ton of money developing 12 games so they can get one winner. Um, and I mean, again, from a business perspective, I don't have an MBA, you know, like I don't, you know, like I'm not a business pro. Right. But that being said, I don't necessarily agree with that strategy. Like if that's really the strategy of investing so much of your resources and 12 independent titles, hoping that one of them hits oil, that doesn't seem as good of an investment as investing in, you know, two or three really good games as a service from reputable, you know, studios to like make it happen. And then like really kind of nourishing those, you know, honestly, I think, I I don't know. I think, I think the play here for them, you know, they have this PlayStation extra PlayStation premium. You know, you got, they got a lot of users on extra, but most people complain about premium. I think what they should have done is taken all of this amount of money, which is a lot. They showed, uh, how they were shifting, how they were, uh, investing their money. I think they were in the next few years are going to switch over like 60% of their investment into live service games. Imagine taking all that money and just sprinkling it across, I don't know, 20, 30 indie devs. Say, Hey, here's the money. Go make a game and it's going to end up on PS plus extra or premium. Right. And that way you start to flesh out your catalog. Get day and date uh, releases for it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so people then when they join, they don't just join for just one game and then pop out. They've got, they know they got this huge back catalog of all these incredible smaller experiences uh, to play and to go through. Yeah, I I agree. That's, that's where I feel the investment should be made because I think when you look at game pass versus what PS premium is offering, there's a clear differentiate, you know, like there's a differentiation there and there's a clear difference in value. Um, and so if Sony made the investment to bolster that service by, you know, even, even if that translated into premium members getting like half off day and date releases for triple a games right like not even necessarily free but like if you're a premium member you can get spider-man 2 for 30 bucks or 35 bucks right or whatever um to to make up for some of that as well as like having those great indie day indie games for day and date releases um yeah but we'll see i i think <clears throat> the live service is a you know games as a service in general is a very very tricky medium genre uh to tackle and you know fortnite came out and did it really well destiny was doing it really well for a while um you know uh, obviously like world of warcraft and things like that um it's but there they there are they are so few and far between and the amount of time and investment it takes to really get a good one like I don't know. Sony should be taking a, a look at that and saying, is that a sustainable model for us? Yes or no. And I think the answer no, is. No, yeah. If they're not careful, they can get burned bad. Like they don't have, you know, Microsoft to like back them. You know, it's just, it's just Sony. Yeah. And even though we see them as a big corporation, they just don't have the kind of cash on hand the way Xbox does. Yeah. So or they could have bought Activision them... for $69 billion if they did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, if it, it for as hard as they say that they're going, they can get in trouble real quick going down that path. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. We've got a new uh, handheld system coming out. We've got the Steam Deck OLED that was announced last week. Um, I, uh, a friend of mine has the Steam Deck, just a standard LCD. And, he, and uh, when I was up in the Bay Area a couple months back, um, he kind of showed it to me. And, you know, it, it looked and felt pretty cool. There's definitely a lot of uh, interesting, like Metroidvania titles and things like that that um, I would enjoy digging into on this on a on a Steam Deck platform. Um, early reviews are saying that the screen obviously is is beautiful, and also that it improves battery life, which was a major pain point of the original release. Uh, and so, so yeah, I mean, I'm excited uh, for for Steam and for the Steam Deck. I think. It's a great piece of hardware. Uh, the 512 gigabyte model is 550. Um, pre-orders begin Thursday the 16th. 
uh, I believe at 10 a.m. Pacific, you use your Steam account. I think it's limited to one per account. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're if you're just looking for a great handheld, you know, uh, PC solution, uh, then you got that there. It's also apparently amazing for emulators and ROMs. You know, you do a little bit of you know tweaking on the back end, but then you can play uh, play some games on there of uh, different varieties and time periods. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What, what what are your thoughts on the Steam Deck, Alan? Are, is it something that you've ever really been interested in digging into? So, like, I'm not a huge portable gamer. Like, I do have a Nintendo Switch. Um, and I like kind of hanging out on the couch watching something and playing, like, Animal Crossing or something where not I'm not, like, too invested or trying to really concentrate on something. Uh, but at the price point of, like, 550 that's that's pricey for just something that I kind of sort of use. So like, I think it's cool that it's out there and I think it's, it's awesome. I think that, uh, having a device that can make something like a steam OS, I think it's called like the operating system that it runs on is a good thing, uh, for just the PC industry in general, because yeah, you'd like to have something comparable to windows. that can, you know, play games and do computer type stuff on. Uh, that to me is more interesting than just like the overall like, form factor. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I, you know, I've got my switch I've got, you know, in terms of like gaming on the go, I've got my iPad, you know, like there's the, you know, the PS remote <clears throat> app that you can use as well. We'll, we'll discuss uh, portable PlayStation um, elements as well in, in just a second with our next story. But um, for me, I think it just boils down to, how often I would actually end up using it. Um, I do enjoy gaming on my PC. I like like being at my desk, sitting down, playing on my on my monitor. Um, I don't know how often I would actually be, you know, playing my Steam Deck anywhere else, kind of like on the go, except maybe traveling at a con or something. Um, so that's the main hold up for me is like I don't know if I could justify the purchase because I don't feel like I would use it enough. But that being said. For folks who do <clears throat> really invest in mobile gaming because they've got limited screens at home or, you know, they've they've got like they work odd shifts or have extended breaks or whatever at their job and they like to bring their console with them for entertainment out and about in the world, um, then this could definitely be a, a really great pickup for them. So I'm 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 happy and excited. Hate to yuck anyone's yum. So happy and excited for those who are able to utilize the Steam Deck. It looks like a beautiful piece of hardware. I'm really glad that the battery life is being enhanced as well. Um, I don't know if ultimately I will pick it up. I'm tempted. I will say that. like, And that is saying something that even though it's hard for me to justify purchasing it, I am really thinking about it <laughs> um, because it's just really tempting. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I hope that it uh, is everything that the broader audience wants it to be. Um. Speaking of gaming on the go, we're getting some early PlayStation Portal reviews as well. Um, so uh, uh, this is the handheld uh, PlayStation sort of second screen solution. It's $199, uh, and it's designed to connect to your PS5 and allow you to uh, play your games, you know, with a, with a be big, beautiful OLED display. Um, and... Yeah, uh, early reviews are pretty good, but it really does emphasize the the fact that it's it's designed to be an extension of your console at home um, and not necessarily like on the go, um, which, again, I don't know how functional that is, um, broadly speaking. Um, Alan, you you have a. You don't have a PlayStation. You have a Switch, but you don't have a PlayStation 5, right? I do have a PS5, yeah. Okay. D is there ever a scenario where you would want something like this, where you can like just play your PlayStation like on, on the PS Portal or something like that, like when you're chilling on your couch? Uh, not really, because I mean, like I kind of have a TV that I can just use to play games on. I don't like, I'm not like a jockeying for position with someone else in the house for the, for the screen. Okay. Not uh, yet. But not yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> but like, you know, if if you do if that if you are in that situation, I can see how this could be helpful of like, oh, maybe, you know, your spouse, your partner's watching, you know, some something on Netflix and 
you can uh, play games while you're sitting next to them and still be in the same room and kind of hanging out while you're doing that. Um, but I think that me personally, like if I were already going up to this uh, PlayStation portal, I would just say, well, why don't I pay an extra 150 now that they drop the price of the LCD uh, uh, Steam Deck and get that? Because like you can do the same thing on the Steam Deck, but you would actually be able to have it be like its own full thing. Like you'd have the whole PC ecosystem to your, uh, you know, at your hand. You could then play your PlayStation 5 games on there and it would actually work when you left the house. It wouldn't be something that's just for the house. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, it'll be the the Steam Deck has that versatility, which is which is really great. Another reason why it's kind of tempting. But um, I'm actually more interested interested and excited about the new uh, audio uh, releases from Sony, the the Pulse Elite headset and the and the buds. So I actually pre-ordered the new Pulse Elite headset, which is coming out, I think, uh, in February next year. Um, really? What is it that uh, caught your attention about them? Well, I mean, it, uh, th- so they acquired, um, oh, gosh, Odyssey. So Sony acquired Odyssey, and they're uh, in basically incorporating the magnetic planar you know, uh, uh, technology in the, in the headphones to really up the overall audio, audio quality. Um, and I'm just a big fan of the standard Pulse headset. I when I lucked out. Oh, by the way, happy third anniversary to the PlayStation Five. Um, I I was one of the very lucky few that happened to snag a pre order off Amazon on launch day. Um, it, thank you, Wario sixty four. Respect, brother. Um, so man of the people. Yeah. Man of the people for real. Like that he is the only reason why I got one on release day. Like much respect. Um, but uh so I got I got the console, I got the headset, I got the you know dual charger, I got the whole kit and caboodle from the start. And I've just always really enjoyed the headset. Um uh, you know, I just like having clicking it on so that my wife doesn't have to worry about hearing like, you know, grunts and gunfire and like all this other stuff when I'm playing my games. I can just have it in my headset. Um and yeah, so I'm I'm super excited for that. Um, but and again, as as for the portal, you know, not a solution for me. I've heard it's a, a great solution for some other folks again who might be jockeying for a TV screen uh, or just looking for a more portable solution at home. Um, and so we'll see uh, we'll see how the broader uh, broader population takes to it. But early reviews again mainly speak to you know it operates as expected. So. Um, not, nothing nothing too earth shattering there uh and then last story of uh for today uh the game awards nominees are here uh so every year uh for the past nearly a decade now about nine years um we've had the game of the year awards run by jeff Keeley, uh and it selects six games uh that represent the pinnacle of gaming and this year obviously it was incredibly difficult uh to <laughs> to ch- to choose um and yet uh we have our our selection so um this year we've got uh alan wake 2 Baldur's gate 3 marvel spider-man 2 resident evil 4 remake super mario brothers wonder and the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom so these are the game of the year selections. Um, Alan, I'm just curious, initial thoughts, reactions on on those picks. I mean, it's a lot of the games that people have kind of been throwing around social media for a bit. So nothing too shocking, except for Resident Evil 4 Remake. I did not think that voters, uh, that the folks who are allowed to vote, would actually give it a shot. I thought they will go, well... Yeah, it's awesome, but you know, it's a remake, so let's put in something else in there. So to me, that's the one really big surprise. Well, they actually gave Resident Evil Four uh, that kind of respect this year. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think I I was also surprised that given how stacked this year was, that the re that as a, as fantastic as the remake was that it would ultimately go to a game that at its core had been released before um, versus new properties like Baldur's Gate 3, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, etc. You know, then again, of course, I hear I hear the smart Alex out there saying like, well, Spider-Man 2 is just Spider-Man again and, you know, whatever. Super Mario Brothers is just Super Mario Brothers. Um, yes, yes, I hear you. But um, 
I, I don't know that that was kind of a surprise for me as well. Um, I was a bit partial. I don't know if you're listening, if you had a chance, we did uh, myself and Sam uh, had our guesses for the game award picks uh, that we posted yet on Sunday. Um, and uh, we both were off by one, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was hoping for armored core six uh, myself. Um, and unfortunately didn't, didn't make the cut. Um, that's okay. I will recover. Uh, where I will not recover, however, is the best RPG category. Um, there is a nomination in that field for uh, Lies of P and Starfield, but not Octopath Traveler 2, which makes me very upset. <laughs> I, I am not happy about it. I told Jeff Keeley so on Twitter. I I also ranted to Jason Schreier about it. I don't think he cares or listens because the internet's a very big place and I'm just one person, but um, I'm very upset by that because I think Octopath Traveler 2 was a superb RPG, are definitely one of the best of the year. Um, and while ultimately, it, you know, Baldur's Gate 3, I think will take home the top prize easily in that Corey category and uh, more than likely in the, in the overall game of the year category. I still think that Octopath Traveler 2 deserved the nod because it was fantastic. So I'm a bit upset about that. Um, yeah, there, like I haven't had yeah. a chance to play uh, mm-hmm. Octopath Traveler 2, but like I believe you. Like for just for me, just on principle, Lies of P shouldn't be there. I feel like another game that is like a traditional RPG should really be there instead of that. Yeah, and I mean, it, I I get it again. Like, Lies of P has like Dark Souls, Elden Ring sort of progression um, elements. Like, I, I I understand that part, um, but yeah, I it's hard for me to um, yeah, it's hard for me to to take that on because I think Octopath Traveler Two is just a really great game and should be in the RPG category. All right, um, well. Regardless, uh, the Game of the Year awards are rapidly approaching. They'll be here in a few weeks. And so if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure you go check out the Game uh, Game Awards website. You can see all the categories and nominations there. Um, uh, do you think we'll get GTA 6 trailer there? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, kind of Funny had a pretty extended conversation about this. Um, and I think... I think Greg Greg made a good point because Blessing and Greg are both talking about this. And, you know, Blessing was like, oh, I think Jeff is going to get on the phone. Or, uh, basically, like, yeah, Jeff's going to get on the phone with Rockstar and be like, hey, let me promote your game, blah, blah, blah. And Greg was like, no, like these conversations already happened. Like, <laughs> like I don't think it's going to be there. And to be fair, I think if if there's any sort of if there's any sort of confirmation that it is going to be at the Game Awards, um, then every time it goes to a trailer and it's not GT six, then the majority of the audience is just not going to pay attention. They're going to tune it out. And so, you know, again, GT six is such a huge property that it will impact like everything around it. And so I think it needs its own, you know, its own premiere, its own debut, like put it up on a YouTube channel at eight in the morning Pacific or whatever, and just, let it ride, you know, like let it, let it take over the discourse in the gaming community for a while, um, either before or after the game awards, either, or, um, because the game awards is, is early December and rockstar said it would be in early December. And so that's what got people kind of thinking about it. Right. Like it would be there, but I think, I think it'll be its own thing. That's my guess. Yeah. I mean, history says that it will be just because right there redemption, which is not, anywhere near as big as Grand Theft Auto got its completely own thing when he got uh, released the trailer. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think uh, regardless, um, yeah, we had a lot to look forward to in December. We got the GTA 6 trailer. We got Game Awards coming out. And in the next week, we have a couple of really cool things to look forward to game-wise. We've got Persona 5 Tactica, which is arriving on Game Pass with a day and date release. Uh, so it'll be on Game Pass as well as, uh, I believe it's, um, yeah, so uh, Persona 5 Tactica is coming out on the 17th on everything, the Switch, PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, 
Xbox Series X, um, but it will be on Game Pass as well for day and date. Uh, and then there's also the Super Mario RPG coming to the Nintendo Switch, the new remake uh, in just four short days for so fans of the uh, classic Super Mario RPG or newcomers one and all uh, look forward to a really cool uh, RPG experience. Um, those are two two games we're looking, looking forward to in the coming week. And with that, we'll go ahead and cut off the dispatch for this week. Uh, but until oh, next- hang on a second. What's up? I just want to bring up. Yes. My theory is holding uh, up. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please, a couple of weeks back. <laughs> I said, wait for it. Sony, after announcing that price hike on PlayStation Plus, come Black Friday, they're going to go, hey, we're going to discount it. And by how much? By how much they raised it, of course. 30% off if you need PS Plus. So just so everybody knows, if you've been thinking about it or maybe going to get a PS5 soon, maybe for Christmas or something, be on the lookout for that. Also, just as a quick reminder, Costco typically has also uh, discounts on uh, basically like the cars, like the, you know, the, you can buy, uh, digital funds for whatever store that you want, eShop or yeah, yeah. Xbox or PlayStation. And they'll typically have a deal where if you buy a uh, hundred dollars worth of it, it'll be on sale for 80. So you're saving $20, 20%. Mm-hmm. So you can stack those discounts. Like if you're interested in, let's say PlayStation extra, which would be about, I think about a hundred dollars after the 30% off from Sony. Then you get that extra twenty percent. You're paying eighty for that service that would typically cost around one thirty, one forty. So that's really something to keep an eye out for. Nice, nice. Got to stack those deals. Um, but yes, I, I definitely good to call attention to that. I think it was it was a good call um, and good to see it, it bearing fruit. Uh, good time to be keeping an eye out for those deals as well. Uh, we will have our holiday gift guide uh, going live probably. Uh, not for this week's episode, but by the time you're hearing this next week, um, we will likely have our holiday gift guide up on the on the Geekly Grind. So keep an eye out for that. And yeah, uh, but <clears throat> until next time, I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. And uh, we hope you all keep gaming. See ya.